Hello! In this module, we're going to discuss David Hume and the problem of evil and God's possible non-existence. So as we know, some people are atheists. They believe that there's no such thing as God, no perfect being. The problem of evil is one argument that God does not exist, widely discussed, and David Hume is one philosopher who put forward the problem of evil as maybe a reason for God's non-existence. It's kind of complicated, as we'll see in a second. So who was David Hume? Well, he was a philosopher. He lived from 1711 to 1776. He lived at the same time as Paley, uh, but disagreed with Paley about a lot of things. Hume was Scottish. He was from Scotland. Scotland is next to England. It's part of, it's part of the uh, island of Britain in the United, what's now the United Kingdom off the north coast of Europe. He was one of the best philosophers, probably very widely respected. Uh, not a perfect philosopher, not a perfect person by any means, but uh, an important philosopher. And at least officially in his writings, in his public writings, he was agnostic. So he said, I don't know whether or not God exists. Um, if you said, does God exist? He would say, mm, maybe. If you said, does God not exist? Mm, maybe in his public writings. But there's a reason to think that he was actually, in fact, an atheist. Why is that? Well, first of all, the arguments or the considerations, the sorts of points he brings up in discussing God, point strongly, if you bought into them, look like they really tell us, they don't just give us reasons to wonder, oh, maybe God doesn't exist, or to doubt, to, to withdraw belief from God's existence, but in fact, they point strongly, if you buy into them, to the conclusion that God does not exist. But why wouldn't Hume just say that? Well, because at the time in Scotland, atheism was, atheism was punishable by execution, and he wouldn't necessarily have been executed, but it would have been a big problem for him if he had just said, God does not exist. And so, on the one hand, his writings look like they point in that direction, and he, yet he had reason to not say that, and that's probably why, in fact, uh, he was atheist, but only publicly was agnostic. So we're going to be reading a selection of uh, from Hume's uh, book, The Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. But we need to set that uh, reading in context. So let's do that. So the problem of evil is widely considered to be a... There's an argument called the problem of evil, which is widely considered to be uh, a powerful argument, whether or not one agrees with the conclusion, a powerful argument against God's existence. And even for those who do believe in God... It's uh, an, uh, an issue, an argument that they really have to contend with. So what is the, this argument? Well, we're going to look at several versions of it. The simplest version is this. There is evil, and if God exists, there is no evil. And if both of those are true, then the conclusion is also true. It's a valid argument. And if the premises are true, uh, then, in fact, the conclusion is true also. And the premises might initially look pretty plausible. And this is basically the argument that Hume puts forward in the dialogue concerning natural religion. But he focuses on what he calls the so these four circumstances. And uh, we're going to need some, under, some context to understand how they're relevant to the problem of evil. So it's really you're going to really want to watch uh, this material on these arguments before you go and look at the Hume reading. Because what we're going to do in... in, uh, in in this, in these lectures, is see, uh, you know, what are these different versions of the problem of evil? And once we get the right version of the argument, then we're going to see, okay, here's what's going on with the Hume. So as I said, this problem, this argument, you know, should doesn't give us a reason to believe its conclusion. Well, if it's valid and the premises are true, then its conclusion is also true, and it does give us a reason to believe the conclusion. But if it's invalid, if it's not valid, or if some of the premises are false, then it doesn't give us a reason to believe the conclusion. Maybe there's some other reason to believe the conclusion, but the argument, if it's either uh, invalid or has false premises, is not uh, a route to the conclusion. So, it is valid. Right? The one premise says, if God exists, there is no evil. And the other premise says, well, but the second, the, the consequent of that conditional is false, and so the if part is true. Right? The argument is like this, if this, then that, well, and then the other premise is not that, and that means that not this as well. So if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true, and uh, we don't need to know anything more about this subject matter to figure that out. 
So the only question left, and it's the one which an atheist and a theist or an agnostic are going to disagree about, is are the premises true? If they both are true, then game over, God does not exist. But if either is false, then the question is still up in the air. So what do we think about these premises? Is there evil? Well, there certainly looks like it. Right, right now we're living in the middle of a pandemic which has killed uh, 500,000 people. That's bad. There's lots of racial injustice and all sorts of other problems of bigger and smaller scope. And so uh, it does look like there's evil. One might say, well, no, actually things are not, that, that's an incorrect appearance, but it certainly looks that way. What about if God exists, there is no evil? Well, that, that's maybe not so obvious. Um, why would that be, you might wonder? Well, we can fill that out. Um, and the way we would do that is by thinking about what God is. So remember, we have this, the idea we're working with, there are different conceptions of God. The one that we're using and uh, talking about, does that kind of thing exist, would be a perfect being. So it would be all-powerful. It can do whatever, make whatever it wants happen. It's all-knowing, so it knows everything about the way the world is and everything about, well, what hap would happen if this were to happen, what would happen if that were to happen. There's all the different ways the world might turn out. And it's perfectly and completely and entirely and purely good. And so what will it do? Well, it's going to do whatever it can to bring about the best, the best outcome. So we can look at then the argument like this. We're going to take as a premise there is evil, but if God exists, there is no evil. We're going to argue to that. It, or at least this argument is going to argue to that uh, sub-conclusion. Say, if God exists, then God is perfect, because that's the kind of conception of God that we're using. And a perfect being would prevent all evil. Now, if both of those are true, then in fact, there would be no evil, right? Because if God existed, then God would be perfect, and uh, that perfect being God would prevent all evil. And so uh, this conclusion follows, that an argument as a whole is valid. If God exists, then God is perfect on the one hand, and if a perfect being would prevent all evil, if both of those two claims are true, then it's also true that if God exists, there is no evil, and then if it's also the case that there is evil, say on the one hand there is evil, but on the other hand if God exists, there is no evil, then the only possible uh, way things could be is that God, in fact, does not exist. So the argument is valid. The question is, are the premises true? Well, if God exists, God is perfect. Given the conception of uh, God that we're using, that's just what we mean when we say that God, the, that's just what God is. And so if there is such a being, God is perfect. There's evil. Yeah, we think that that's probably true. Maybe not certain, but very likely to be true. What about this? A perfect being would prevent all evil. Well, that's at least not so obvious. Would a perfect being prevent all evil? Why or why not? Okay, the fact that we have to ask that question tells us that this premise is not just self-evident and requires more investigation. And in fact, we might think that a perfect being might not prevent all evil. Why not? Well, when the perfect being creates the world, creates the universe, creates all these beings, rocks and mountains and rivers and trees and octopuses and elephants and human beings, well, maybe that God gives some of those creatures, like us, the human beings, free will. And so it's up to us how to act. And unfortunately, some of us use that free will to do evil things. And if that's the case, well, sort of when God creates, God in a sense gives up some of her power by giving uh, human beings free will, which on this picture is a good thing. It's good that there are these beings with free will in the universe. But unfortunately, it's used in evil ways. And so we can think of evil. What is evil? Evil is the cost of free will. And so this perfect being would not prevent all evil because they've created beings with free will. And with that, inevitably comes evil. So, okay. We might then, though, if we were trying to pursue this problem of evil argument, say, okay, so maybe that, that argument we looked at isn't going to work. Maybe it's not the case that a perfect being will prevent all evil, but let's get a little bit subtler. So let's distinguish between moral evil 
as natural evil. Moral evil would be evil choices and evil con and their evil consequences, whatever those may be. In that case, say, okay, so God creates the universe, God creates earth, God creates more or less directly beings with free will, and those beings with free will go on to use their free will, and unfortunately, they make some evil choices, and so there's inevitably moral evil. But what about the natural evil? That's all the other evil. Right? That's the diseases like COVID and earthquakes and hurricanes and all the rest of that. Maybe why would there be that? So you might think, okay, a perfect being might allow for moral evil, but maybe a perfect being would prevent all natural evil. After all, that natural evil is not within the scope of any human being's free will or any other being's free will. And so that's ent it's entirely up to the perfect being. The perfect being says, I don't want that. I don't want any of that natural evil, and stops it. So we could revise our argument. And we would say, if God exists, God is perfect. Leave that premise alone. But we'd have these, t uh, you know, and, and this argument is going to be valid. But we would have two new premises. We wouldn't say a perfect being would prevent all evil. We'd say just a perfect being would prevent all natural evil. And we would say not that there is evil, but there is natural evil. And then our argument goes through as uh, it's still valid. If God exists, God is perfect, and a perfect being will prevent all natural evil, which means if God exists, there's no natural evil. But look, there is natural evil, and so God does not exist. Valid argument. Again, the question is, are all the premises true? Well, uh, if God exists, God is perfect, still true. There's natural evil, sure. Some of the evil in the world looks like it's natural. It's not due uh, entirely or at all to human choices. The consequences of COVID are due partially to human choices, right? The structure of society, how quickly did we develop vaccines, inequities in the health system, and all of that. But it's partially at least a natural evil. But what about this one? A perfect being would prevent all natural evil. Well, again, as it turns out, this one is problematic as well. So maybe some natural evil is for the best, and it's unavoidable. Why would that be? Well, here are a couple possibilities. You might think, oh, well, if some humans using their free will have acted evilly and harmed others, murder, oppression, whatever, uh, you know, violated the Ten Commandments, whatever it is, uh, maybe the natural evil is punishment for that, right? Uh, maybe, so that might be what the flood was, right? Noah's flood, if you think that the that happen, you know, oh, why does, you know, God flood the earth? Because he's punishing the humans. So natural evil is a punishment. Or uh, maybe natural evil is there to, uh, you know, teach us some lesson about grit and resilience. Or why does God send this difficult weather to teach us, you know, how to live through it or to sort of show us how small we are or something like that. Or maybe the natural evil is there in order to... Uh, I, I don't know, you know, part of God's plan. So why are there these earthquakes? Well, because that's part of the plate tectonics. And why do we need plate tectonics? Well, because it makes certain resources available to humans, and that's part of the best plan. Or who knows? Some idea like that. So some people who, theists, are going to say, yeah, you know, maybe some natural evil is actually is for the best, and it's part of God's plan. It's part of the way a perfect being uh, creates the world. In fact, all natural evil is that way, they suggest. So Hume is going to have to deal with this idea that that you know um, a theist can say uh, no, uh, God will allow for natural evil as long as it's part of the uh, plan for the best, and Hume wants to say well that's an idea they could have. Nonetheless, my problem of evil argument is going to work. So. He's going to have to reformulate his argument again. We've already seen he started with a simple problem of evil, then we, where we had sort of didn't talk about what kind of evil, then we said, oh, let's talk about natural evil in specific, and now we're going to need to get even more sophisticated. And so we're going to talk about that more sophisticated argument and the last version before we're ready to read Hume in the next video. So I will see you there.